Welcome to the Chamber's um, new video series. We um, believe that one of the values that we can provide to our members is the uh, opportunity to explore issues in our community, to better get to know some of the folks that are contributing to our community, um, and, and just really kind of have a chance to dig in on, on material and, and conversations that that you know might do better in a in a live conversation format as opposed to um, you know a written article or something of that nature. And so um, today we're we're here. Uh, we're going to be joined by a couple of of, of uh, business owners uh, here in Santa Maria uh, to kick off our first video series. And we're excited to share this information with our members. Um, let me introduce my guest today, um, uh, Teresa uh, Arredondo. Right? Did yes, I get that that's right? Yes, correct. Um, Teresa is the owner and CEO of Artcraft, and which is a very unique and really cool business here in Santa Maria that I think a lot of people don't know is out there. Um, and so we're going to find out a little bit more about what um, they do as a business, but we're also going to talk about uh, her experiences as a business owner and, and leader in the community. And then I'm also joined by Edgar Gascon. Edgar um, is the owner of Hacienda Realty um, and with his family, part of a number of other businesses uh, here in, in the community. Um, um, perhaps just as importantly for me right now, Edgar's the chair of the board of directors for the, for the Chamber of Commerce. And so uh, he's a, a really important partner for me uh, in, in for the staff as we uh, try to make sure that the, the chamber is responding to what our community really needs. Well, so appreciate, appreciate your leadership thank there, you, Edgar. Appreciate and, that. Um, enjoyed having you on the board. Um, let, me, let me start, Teresa, with you and just ask you to take a couple of minutes and just tell us um, a little bit, how, did, how long have you been in Santa Maria? If, if you're not from here, how'd you get here? Um, and then maybe talk a little bit about how you got into the business that you're in today and um, how, how Artcraft came to be. Well, um, like you said, my name is Teresa Arredondo. Um, and I do own uh, Artcraft Paint. It's an aircraft painting facility here in Santa Maria at the Santa Maria Airport. It has to be in an airport because what we do is we um, we restore aircrafts, that's what we do. We refurbish and uh, paint interior, a little bit of a window replacement, and a little bit of mechanical work, not so much, but our main focus is um, into the painted. I've been a Santa Maria resident for over 43 years. Um, I immigrated from Mexico. I got here when I was 15 years old, and um, this is what I call my second home. I was born in Mexico, immigrated to Santa Maria, like I said before, and this is it. I don't think I'm going to go anywhere else. Uh, this is where my mother uh, decided to make her the home where she was uh, living for uh, almost 50 years, and this is where she got buried. So this is where I'm staying. Our craft, um, it's a, like I said, it's an aircraft painting facility. We have clientele from all over the world, uh, from the Middle East to Argentina, from Europe, all kinds of uh, customers from all over the world. And, uh, you know, it's been a, a very unique adventure, a very unique because um, this uh, is a niche that I found uh, about 31 years ago. And uh, I am so happy and so blessed to chose this industry because it's su such a unique industry. Um, it's very tight. Uh, one big advantage is that it's global. The big disadvantage for me is that it's been um, a very small amount of females in this industry. It's still a uh, male-dominated nominated, uh, industry. And uh, so we, we just go with the float. We just <laughs> let things happen and if any challenges rise then we'll just overcome that and we keep going that's great we're going to talk more about some of those that business experience but let me get edgar to kind of kind of the same deal edgar how did i think you're from santa maria originally but but maybe had the family choose this area originally and yeah and then how did you get into the business you're in and and what what is what do you do uh, within that business yeah so long i mean just to kind of wrap all that story long story short my family um both my parents are from mexico uh love story right my mom moved here and her, her family was brought uh to mexico from mexico when she was 13 uh, and then shortly after there were some visits back to mexico but dad met her and 
he ended up coming over he's, and he was nice. I'm going with her. He's like, I'm going with her. I'm chasing her. <laughs> so at 18, that happened. And uh, they've been here for, gosh, what's that, 30, 35 years or so. Uh, so they've been here and, and uh, born and raised in Santa Maria. Um, and so ended up going to, you know, all the schools here, graduated, said I'm never coming back, right? Like 99.9% of us, uh, percent of us and went to college, ended up getting my, my master's in Seattle and worked corporate for about a year, year and a half. Then it just wasn't for me. It just wasn't the, the career that I envisioned. Ended up coming back to town. And, uh, and at that point we had a few businesses. Uh, my folks had a Mexican restaurant. Uh, most, most recently they had been opening up a furniture store and, uh, and I had the opportunity to, to kind of manage that and, and get my feet wet in sales, uh, some management positions, uh, and just kind of learn the crafts of just running a business because that in itself is, is nothing that school prepares you for. <laughs> yeah, so um, so I did that. And then what was the other one? How did I get into it? Yeah, how'd you get into How'd you decide to start Hacienda? Uh, it was always one of those things where uh, you had real estate in the back of your mind because your parents were in it. Um, so they have been, been at it for about 15 years, but never thought that I would be a realtor, right? The day in and day out uh, professional in real estate. I always thought that I would just kind of dabble in investments. Uh, but it turned out to be the, the, biggest, the biggest career that I, I pursued. And now having, having the opportunity to, to open this and, and be able to, to move on into a family business and, and leave that, I think it's, it's really important because having seen my parents build their own, getting the opportunity to now build this has, has, been, has been a great opportunity. So, you know, you represent a story that, that we talk about all the time at the Chamber um, and, and with the community, right? So one of the concerns that I hear all the time in places like Santa Maria uh, is, you know, our, the, our kids leave uh, to, to go to school, to have that adventure, whatever, um, and, and they never come back, right? That's the narrative. That's the story we hear. And, and I think more, there, there are probably more cases like you where you did come back than we, than we recognize, right, but, sure. but it's still a concern for a lot of families, right? That, that, that their kids are going to go off to someplace else and, and not come back. Talk, talk a little bit about that decision to come back. Um, what were you nervous about, right? Um, you know, and, 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 and how, you, you know, how did you make that decision? And, you know, as you did the pluses and minuses, what were some of the things you were thinking about? You know what? It was a, it was a very difficult decision, right? It's a difficult decision because having been the only child, having had uh, everything poured into into who I was, into into hey, here's here's Edgar's education, here's his future, here's his career. Um, to turn back around and go, hey, yeah, that wasn't kind of what I was hoping for. Kind of, you know, it, it, it was a, it was a mixed mixed emotions of. I'm sure my parents want me back at home, right? Because I'm sure every parent now loves their kids being close to them. But at the same time, it's okay, well, you know, there was time, uh, resources, money that was invested and it didn't pan out. So uh, it was a little bit of shame, right? I think those first few months, boy, it was hard to get out of bed. It really was. <laughs> yeah. uh, and just to go to work and, and there's no shame in, in, in being a furniture salesman. It was just, I hadn't lived up to what my parents thought or wanted or hoped and I think that was a hard decision um, but the opportunity was here and I think I always had a little bit of salesperson in me uh, unfortunately my previous job even though it was a the degree that I pursued it was a very seated nine to five in front of a screen and we were just talking off camera my bread and butter is, is face to face I, I love talking to people I love being in front of people and helping people and if that happens to be in sales um, then it, it was that route. And I think that that presented the best opportunity for me to be back home. And I think that's, that's kind of where I've, I've flourished from different opportunities uh, in, their, in my parents' business who, who paved the way with the, with the businesses, with the footsteps of, of me being just simply prepared. And then also getting involved in the chamber. You know, the chamber uh, took me in and, and said, yeah, we want your help. And so <laughs> <laughs> went from being an ambassador to then, you know, on the board and, and, and now here with you. And, and so that's been a, a great opportunity to just get to know people. I think that's where, where the decision was made, knowing that I had opportunities instead of forcing a path that maybe just didn't align to, to what I thought I wanted. Yeah, thanks. So Teresa, you represent a, a really common story in our community, right? I do. A family that came here, um, both in both your cases from Mexico, but but from other places, looking for that opportunity to do something to advance your family, right? Um, 
Interestingly, in both cases, your parents, your mom, and then you, um, part of that path was becoming a, a business owners, right? Start, starting or buying into or becoming a, an owner of a business. Um, talk about that experience and what it was like as an immigrant um, in Santa Maria, uh, trying to find that path and, and trying to build some success for you and your family. What, how was that? Well, to answer that, I need to go a little bit back. When I was nine years old back in Mexico, I was a sales person. That's how my, my whole entrepreneur started. Um, I was nine years old when uh, I was selling plums that we um, collected from the hills. It was wild fruit. And then we have to sell it at school. So, you know, my aunts, the people that I used to, that, that raised me back in Mexico because my mother left all of us, 10 children behind. She immigrated to Santa Maria. And why she ended here is because of agriculture, because mm -hmm. that's all she knew. So when I was nine, I was a salesperson. And I, I used to sell plums and I used to sell ice cream bars, like anything that I can put my hands on, I sell it. So. I decided, you know, that I, every time that they give me a basket for the, uh, full of fruits, they uh, tell me, okay, you have to bring 20 pesos. Well, the wild fruit is, is not even, right? You know, some are big, some are small. So I have to sell four plums for one peso. So what happened is that they were not, they were hard for me to sell the small ones because the, the big ones, they were going faster. So what I decided to do is I decided to split them and then sell three of the big ones for one peso and four of the small ones for, for one peso, right? So without knowing, I started to make profit. <laughs> <laughs> so right there I said, you know what? I can do this better than what I was doing it. It was a very early age that I started doing sales. So really I can sell a bag of sand in the desert. <laughs> I can sell a block of Just ice a and natural entrepreneur and yes. saleswoman. I like so, it. And, and you know what? The beauty that I discovered is that every single business needs a salesperson. doesn't matter how big or how small it is. If it's a big corporation or a small mom and pop business. So I discovered that that was my talent, that that was really what I, I was good at it. So I immigrated here to the United States, like I said at, at the beginning, and then I started selling clothing. You know, I started working on the fields, you know, picking strawberries, broccoli, and everything that we grow on the, on the Central Coast. So I started selling clothing on the weekends. So my sales came back, you know? And so what I did is I started looking for uh, other options. So being an employee was not enough for me. I'm, I'm always looking for what is gonna make me feel good. And um, so, I, I was like from doing furniture, from opening a poster shop on my garage. And uh, I, 19 years old, I leased a couple, lands, uh, couple acres of land and I became a grower. Um, and I went from one step to the next one, you know, always getting more and more difficult. So one day I just was not happy with whatever I was doing. So I went and I applied to this company that I own right now and uh, they didn't give me the job because I was a woman. The gentleman said, no, this is a man's job. This is not for a woman. And I said, okay. So I did everything to get my husband being hired. <laughs> and then after him, I came along. And when that happened, you know, my entire dream is starting to come true. Because when I was nine, I, was, I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be, I want people to know who I was. You know, I knew I have the ability to do something big, but I just didn't know how big it was. And um, here I am. How long did you work for the company before you had the chance to become the owner? One year. One year I worked for the company after he underestimated my ability and my capacity. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you know, um, he came to me and offered me if he, I wanted to buy the upholstery shop. And then I say, sure, how much? And he said $750. $750, that's what I buy for the upholstery shop. 
So then my husband became, you know, like the upholstery, the lead guy, and then I hired my brother and then my sister-in-law, and then we were four of us running that, that upholstery shop that the truth is that who knew that I was going to be where I'm at right now, right. right? So a year later, he ended up offering me to buy half of the painting business. And then I say, sure, how much? 150000 that's what I pay for 50% of the painting facility uh, for the business. And uh, so he um, said, uh, okay, so we make a deal. I'll pay you 150 with no interest, no nothing, $10,000 payment, and we, he agreed. Well, a year later, he ended up getting divorced because he already sold out his half. Then I became a partner with his ex-wife. So more sooner than later, I ended up getting everything. So one year for the first phase, and then two more years to finalize the entire business. And here I am, 31, uh, over 30 years later, um, here I am, 100% owner of that one business that they underestimated my ability and my capacity to <laughs> Somebody sell. Somebody made a mistake, yeah, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's who I am, that's what I do, and here I am in, in this beautiful community. So, so you, you, you mentioned earlier that some of the challenges you've had is that you, as a woman, kept mm -hmm. stepping into businesses that everybody else were men. Right? Yes. Um, and, and so you had those kind of challenges to overcome. You're also a minority, um, mm -hmm. right, and, and an immigrant to the country. Um, were there challenges associated with that um, that, that made it more difficult for you maybe to build your business than, than it would have for somebody else? Oh, yes. You know, I'd, uh, I only went to school in Mexico to seventh grade, and I didn't graduate. I did not even finish it. So I started learning how to speak English when I was 26 years old. And I've been forced to, to learn the language. I don't, I don't speak it right, but I, I defend myself pretty well, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so when, when I was told that was not for a woman, that was my first challenge. Later on, in a total of three years, I proved him that he was wrong. So then later on, I ended getting divorced. And when I ended up getting divorced, of course, you know, in this industry, it was about, I want to say 95% male, mm -hmm. you know, pilots, mechanics, uh, aircraft owners, you know, you name it. Right. But when I got divorced, I got a one phone call from a gentleman and from Portobello, California. And he was looking for my husband at that time. And uh, I said, well, he's no longer with the company. I am the owner. And he said, I will never do business with a woman. And he hang up. Second challenge, right? So everything that I've been put against the fence, and I feel that I've been cornered because I'm immigrant, because I'm Hispanic, because I don't have a profession like a pilot, mechanic, or you name it. Um, I always use that in my favor. I always use that to prove them how wrong they are by judging right. the book by the cover, right? right? So what I have done in, the, in this 30 some years is that I have been proven myself more than anybody else what I'm capable to do. And um, yeah, I Four and a half years, I started taking the classes to become a citizen. I was the first one to become citizen in, in my entire family. Why? Because for me, it was looking at what can I add to myself to become a better asset to this community and to this country. And that's what I have done. Every time that I've been pushed, or like I said, I've been cornered out, I always make myself better so I can prove them that they're wrong and I'm right, because I'm always right. So don't challenge her. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Edgar, same kind of question, right? Uh, your family came from, from Mexico as well. Um, 
you know, and I'm sure your folks have talked about, you know, starting businesses in this community. What were some of the obstacles? What, what were the hard things that they had to deal with? And, and were any of those specific to the fact that they were immigrants? Um, yeah, you know what? I, I've, um, I've spoken a lot to my folks about that. I think, I think we've been very fortunate to not have, have, been, um, have been the targets of, of certain isolated uh, events, right? And I, I'm sure I've had friends and family and, and other uh, people that I've known that have had those instances. Uh, you know, I ha haven't personally said I can feel, I've felt many of those, but, um, but I know that my family did have some of the more general um, issues coming, coming into business, right? I would say language is, is a huge one. It's a big one. And then the second thing, and I think even up to this day, is resources, right? I think that's the two of the big ones. And I say that for my parents 30 years ago, and I say that for my clients today. Uh, I'm sure you, you know, you're a businesswoman, so you're around I business am. people. And we hear this all the time. So yeah. resources, you're talking about access to capital. Exactly. Um, people. People. Relationships. relationships those kinds right? of All things. those things, right. right, that are, that are, and maybe we don't think about it so much because we look at the radio ads or the TV ads and they're in English and, oh yeah, I heard about this ad or I heard about these funds that are out there. Oh yeah, my buddy on the newspaper said that this and this, you know, money is available for, for small businesses. But it's, it's, it's the simple fact that it's not in getting to those communities, getting to those people and their, their, in their hands, in their yep. language. That just, you know, cuts the communication in half. So I think that's a huge thing, right? It's, it's not being able to, A, read those papers, which is the language barrier. And second is those resources aren't provided um, oftentimes in those. And I think that goes for almost any, any immigrant, I would say, um, any so, age range. Yeah, so, so to both of you, I'll put this same question. Um, what could we do as a community now, right? And, and, you know, the pandemic, you know, the COVID thing makes it maybe a unique moment, but, but, but even beyond that, yeah. right? 2021, 2022, what could we do in Santa Maria to make it easier for people to either start a business or grow a business? Um, you know, I'm sure you're always trying to find people that are talented to hire, to run your business. What, what are some of the things that this community could do that would make it easier to be successful in business? I, I think uh, what has been helping me is that I, I establish a, a really good relationship with my clients. So if you have a client, for example, I'm pretty sure that you, uh, Edgar, in your business, your family business, you guys use the network big time. And I think uh, we as a community, we need to empower the business owners to network among us uh, because I think that's what has been the key for me. Um, I t used to tell my customers, if you're not happy, don't pay me. But if you're happy, you pay me and you're going to go tell five people <laughs> where you got your aircraft referred. Right. And so that was my marketing. Um, marketing for like uh, uh, Edgar said, um, it's one, probably one of the things that a lot of the business are, are lacking in, you know, like with the new, um, the new way to advertise is the social media, right? And uh, for me, it's really hard. You know, luckily I have my daughter, you know, Esmeralda, she's been, she's all into that. And uh, you know, like your parents have you, but some of the business owners, they don't have uh, Edgar or an Esmeralda. So I think helping them to understand the importance of the social media, it's, it's a key. Um, you know, helping them to network among business. You know, how to become more open into the new, the new things. Um, I said that the reason why I've been successful is because I make every one of my clients responsible to promote me. That's the key for me. You put them on your team. I put them in my team. Right. I make them part of my family. It's funny that you say that, but I, my saying in my business is everybody comes in as a customer. I'm going to make sure that they leave as a friend. I like that. That's a great way to approach business. Any thoughts from you, Edgar, as to, you know, how do we, how do we make more businesses more successful yeah. in this community? I think whether they're immigrant or not, right? I just 
in general? Yeah, I, I think as Manala touched on that, you know, from the beginning. Teresa. I'm sorry, <laughs> Teresa. I don't know. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Teresa. Because I said Esmeralda. Oh, Esmeralda, exactly. I'm sorry. Was um, network. Right? I think your network has absolute everything to do. And we always hear, you know, your network is your net worth. And you hear that. And, and to some degree, yes. But, I mean, you got to get out there and just meet people. Right. And, and I think I think the only thing that I will say as a young Latino business person was I was very fortunate for not only my parents, but the extended family of mine is, is very entrepreneurial. It's very business minded. And I had uncles, aunts um, kind of help and shape that thought process of just business. Right. But a lot of times there's not a mentorship. Yeah. Right. A lot of times there's not those relationships to have. I'm not at the point now where maybe you're 30 years old and or I'm, I'm sorry, I'm 30 years old and. And, uh, and you, you need to get outside of your bubble and learn from business owners that are in different industries, at different levels. You know, Teresa, you're, you're three times you know, my, my size of company with your experience. Let's go have a cup of coffee, let's learn, right? And, and you, hey, who do you think I can meet? Who do you think I can learn from? And, and grow your network that way. And it has to be probably the single key to, to not only knowing people, but collecting knowledge and, uh, and hearing from their, from their experiences. The great thing about your your family business, uh, you know, is that you guys are are local or or county. Um, in my case, I has to I have to travel like Europe. I have to travel like Mexico. I have to travel like Central America. I have to travel outside of my my boundaries, yeah, right? right. Um, and that's why I discovered that making my clients responsible to promote my business has been the key for me, but for you know any other company like for example like a, a place where they rent uh, equipment for parties you know for example that's a very local local business well have your clients to refer your business to family members and you know neighbors and everybody else um, the network it's it's one thing the other one is the mentorship like he said I always surround myself with, with uh, very, very wise people, very intelligent, very successful. Uh, you know, my, my team, I want to say my team, it's, it's people that are being doing, making the difference in aviation, like writing laws, rules, regulations in the, in the industry. Those are the people that I surround myself. Well, my advice to all of those, uh, business people in the community or in the county level or whatever you, they're going to see this interview or this this um it's surround yourself with the key people in your community you know just don't think that for example um edgar i want to call you hector <laughs> edgar it's not to my level no because they started at one point you know they started somewhere that you right. need to start Right. He's going where you want to go or higher than he is. So uh, mentorship, it's, it's a key. Find somebody. Find somebody in your industry that you can grab and, and learn from them. Yeah, I think that's important that as you, you, know, you start within your own industry and find those people that you can grow from. But then as you were talking about, then you start to get outside your industry and just find smart people, right? And people that have walked maybe a different path but can share a a method or a technique or something with you. So, um, well, I think we're about wrapping up on time, but I, just any, any last thoughts that you want to share about um, art craft or you know, your experience in Santa Maria or um, advice for businesses that are trying to get up and be successful every day? All that I could say for any business owner is if somebody tells you no, prove it that they're wrong. If you want to do something, how bad do you want it? Go for it, fight it, get it. Don't let nothing stop you. That's really my advice. Yeah, I love that. That's really good. Mr. Chairman, I'll give you the last word. And with that, you know, feel free to ask. You know, that's what we're here for. We're the chamber, we're business owners, we're friends, we're family, ask. So when, you, when, you, when you're running the race and you hit a wall and you keep hitting it and you want to break through it and you want to break through it, Maybe ask a friend and they tell you there's a door next door, right? And yeah. you walk around. So ask those people around you, you know, surround yourself with a good team and, uh, and just keep working hard. Always. That's good. Yeah. Great advice. 
I want to thank everybody for joining us. I really want to thank Teresa and Edgar thank you, thank for taking some time to, to sit down and chat with us. Um, look forward to more of these kind of conversations as we really get to know uh, the real leaders in our community, the people that are um, creating wealth in our community, that are providing jobs for people in our community, um, and, and help with their help um, identify ways that we can make Santa Maria um, truly the best place on the Central Coast to live, work, and run a business. And have fun. So stay tuned for more.